Okay, last week we finished up our discussion of the book of Acts and began to get into the introductory material on the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans. And I didn't mention last week, but if you read quite a bit about it, some people have even called it the gospel according to Paul. And I think those of you who are familiar with the key verses we noted last week and some of the key words can understand why someone might say that the letter of the Romans is the gospel according to Paul. Uh, we indicated that the first key verses that he laid out that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he also went ahead to say in verse 17, for therein, and that therein means the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Then we looked at 8, 1 and 2, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, for the law of, spirit, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. And then chapter 10, 1 through 3, Paul manifests his attitude toward the Jews when he said, my heart's desire and my prayer to God, I think the American Standard says supplication to God is for them that they may be saved. And then he indicates they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, then they had not subjected themselves to the righteousness of God, which righteousness, again, is the gospel of Christ. Remember, gospel means glad tidings or good news. And then we noted key words such as all, because the gospel is for all, because all have sinned, Romans 3.23. And that uh, reckoned is used several times in the book. And it means that by belief and obedience to the gospel, remember it's God's power to save, then he reckons to us uh, the blessings of being faithful, which we would be by compliance to his will, the gospel and obedience to it. And thus he sees us because we're baptized into Christ and in the baptismal waters, as it were, the efficacious power of the blood of Christ forgives sins was applied. We were baptized, in other words, into his death, which he will say in Romans 6, 3 to 4. And it's in his death that one comes in contact with the blood of Christ. And thus he's raised to walk in newness of life. He's a new creature in Christ. So uh, that's one of the things that he makes clear. He talks about righteousness again. Being righteous is right doing. Uh, to do rightly then under the gospel system is to be following the teachings of the New Testament of Christ. And that puts us in a right relationship with God. Thus we are, Romans 12, 1 and 2, reconciled to God. Now, sometimes people make a mistake in the denominational world in particular because they'll say that God has reconciled to man. No, that's not right. Man's reconciled to God. Man's the offender. Man is the sinner, sins the transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Man left God. God didn't leave man. And he left God by transgressing his law, and thus uh, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Death meaning separation from God. So through Christ and his life suffering and death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and through our belief in him, a living, active, obedient belief, then we are made righteous, as it were, by the blood of Christ. So in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, when Paul gives that account of his conversion to Christ, he says that Ananias, the preacher that Christ selected to send to him, said to him, who at that time was a believer and a repentant person, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, to call on the name of the Lord 
is to appeal to the authority of the Lord. And to appeal to the authority of the Lord is to submit to the will of the Lord. And thus, those people on the day of Pentecost, having heard the preaching of the apostles, and were pricked in their heart due to their sins, their conscience hurt them, wanted to know what to do to be saved. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37. And then taking them as repentant believers, Peter told them to be baptized for the remission of sins. So they were, their sins were remitted, that is, the sins that originally separated them from God, when they were baptized in order to reach the remission of sins. That's the idea of for or unto, or the Greek word ace, which translates the King James, the word for, in Acts 2.38. The American Standard, they use the word unto, which means in order to a given end. So to the believer who's repented of sins, confessed one's faith in Christ the Son of God, then that person is qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. Having done that, the Lord adds him to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. And that's what is meant by Paul when he said to the Galatians that they were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27. So one is made righteous because of one's belief a living, active, obedient belief in the message of the gospel. And the terms that is laid down for us to accept and comply with in order to be the beneficiaries of what God through Christ has done for us that we never could do for ourselves. Then also, Paul uses, we said last week, the term God forbid, and usually he's, he, he did it in Romans uh, 6 because there was a view that says, well, when you sin and you're saved by grace through an obedient faith, then you don't have to be too concerned as a new creature in Christ about living like the New Testament teaches. And so Paul says, shall we continue in sin? The idea of continue is continuing to live in a way that we were living before we were obedient to the gospel. Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, dead, separated from by our own will to comply with the Lord's will, that's conversion. Thus, we are determined with all of our power to learn the truth, and through that truth, our obligations to God. That's what it means to be faithful to the Lord's church. And thus, we're in a position where the grace of God, God's favor that we don't deserve and can't merit, can continue to allow the blood of Christ that we contact in um, being baptized into his death to continually cleanse us from our sins. And so you have 1 John 1, 7 saying, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that would be the light of the gospel. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And we pointed out at times on 1 John 1, 7, that the word cleanseth there in the Greek is a present tense verb. And present tense in the Greek means it continues on. It's not just done in the present. It just continues on doing whatever it does. So the blood, as it were, that we contact and being baptized into the death of Christ continues to cleanse us as we are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And he says uh, that that's really, that's a definition, a divine definition of what it is to be faithful. Romans 2, or rather Revelation 2, 10 says, be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive a crown of life. Why am I faithful? I'm faithful in that I continue steadfastly and unmovable in the truth of God's word. And it's not vain life. It's not worthless. You're rewarded by God when you live faithful in the church and you die faithful in the church. That's what it means to be a Christian one who is of Christ. So all of that's involved, and you must remember these people would have heard the gospel. 
This wasn't written to people outside the Lord's church. He's writing to Christians. As you know, most of the New Testament's written to Christians, having to do with keeping them faithful, keeping them with a living, active, obedient faith. So you have the key thought that we brought out last week in chapter 1, verse 17, the just, those who are justified before God, the just shall live by faith. It's like Jude 3, where we're taught to contend for the faith once for all delivered the saints. And as we pointed out too last week and how many times that the term faith there, that is an integral part of living right before God, of being righteous before God, stands for the whole New Testament system or any part of it, as Jude uses it when he said, contend for the faith once for all delivered the saints. So the just shall live by faith. Well, who are the just? Those who have become Christians. How do they become Christians? By belief in Christ, repenting of their sins, Acts 17, 30, confessing their faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. That's how you become just. Well, if you're just, you don't try to keep on sinning. You do the opposite. You try to do all you can to know the will of God in the church and live like the name you wear, Christian, which means of Christ. So how do the just, how do those who are justified before God in the church live? They live by faith. They live by the New Testament system. And that's why you have James in James 1.25 saying, that whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Again, James was writing to Christians. He was writing to those who were justified, the members of the church, those who heard the same gospel we have in our New Testaments today, who had believed it and obeyed it. Now, what are they to do now that they're in the church? And remember, in Acts 2, those that were baptized for the remission of sins were added to the Lord's church by the Lord himself. Acts 2, verse 47. So, Paul, in writing to these, not writing to people who never heard of God or Christ or the gospel. He's writing to Christians to help them in understanding what it is to be a Christian, how to live the Christian life. Now, he applies the truth that he's writing here to the situation as it existed in the church 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. And he was trying to get the Jews to understand that what the law taught concerning their being alienated from the Gentiles was done away with. And that in Christ, by the gospel in Christ, they were all one in Christ. And he was making that clear to the Gentiles also, because the church at Rome, as was characteristic of many of the churches, if not most all of them, was that you had Gentile converts, Christians, and Jewish converts, Christians. It was a hard thing for the Jews to give up all of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of bias and prejudice that they had toward an uncircumcised Gentile. And Paul writes this letter, and it's applied at that time to them. And yet truth is truth is truth and always will be truth regardless of what anybody thinks about it. So our duty today in studying this 2,000-year-old letter or any of the Bible to bring the truth out of it without dragging over the particular problems that it was originally applied to when God originally revealed it. And that's part of what's involved in our study of the Scriptures in learning how to rightly divide or handle aright the word of truth, which we're expected to do. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And that's why we're having such studies as this, and we'll always be studying like this, so that we can keep our minds refreshed with the truth, have deeper insights into it, and realize that simply because we're justified by obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ for the remission of our alien sins, that that doesn't mean it ends when we rise from the water grave of baptism 
That's just the birth of water and the spirit, John 3 and verse 5. It's just simply the beginning. Now we grow up in Christ. How do you do that? You continue to study and apply the truth in your decision-making processes to all the whatevers of life. And you answer it as you please with the thus saith the Lord. That's why James 1.25 reads as it does. And that's why that Colossians 3.17, again, Paul writing the members of the church at Colossae, and he told them that whatsoever they, were to, they did, they were to do it in the name or by the authority of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So if you're faithful, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10.17, then at, to remain faithful as a justified person, remember, the just shall live by faith, then you continue to live as the New Testament teaches Christians to live. You worship as the Lord in his word has authorized us to worship. And thus, when we assemble on the first day of the week, for example, we do that because we're authorized to do it. When we do what we do in that assembly of worship, in the five acts or avenues of worship, then we do that because the Lord says, that's the way I want to be worshiped. Through the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as we direct those songs to God and speak to one another and teach one another in those songs. As we engage in our prayers, as we observe the Lord's Supper, showing forth his death till he come again. As we give of our means, that is, as God has prospered us cheerfully, without grudging, for God loves a cheerful giver. And uh, we give then as we've been prospered. And Paul even says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapters 8 and 9 that we're to grow in this grace also, that giving of our means is a, a favor that we can, because we can't outgive in anything what Christ gave. So in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. He makes it clear that our bodies are to be offered as living sacrifices unto God, which is our reasonable service. So with all that in mind, then you have the letter of, to the Romans. And you might keep all that in mind when you read any of the letters that make up most of the New Testament, because they're all written to Christians. They were written 2,000 years ago, as I said, to be applied to the situations at that time. But the truth that was applied to their situations is the same truth we apply to our situation. So that's what we're interested in doing, is being able to know the truth of God's word and how to become a Christian, how to identify a Christian, what it says about the church, its organization, work and worship, and our individual lives in Christ, living as Christians teaches also about marriage, uh, who is qualified to be married, who uh, uh, may divorce and who may not, uh, who as a divorced person may marry and who may not. All of that set out in the rightly divided word of truth because therein is the only place that you learn about what the Lord's authorized as to how we should live before him. And Jesus said in John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So it's his last will and testament where he manifests his authority. And that's the New Testament of the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And then in verse 15, he said to the apostles, if you love me, keep my commandments. There is no proof of our faith in Christ and the gospel system or our love for God, Christ, and all the things that are of God. There's no proof of it other than our compliance with his will. And this is something that was constantly said and reminded uh, the, or the Christians of the first century were reminded throughout these letters in the New Testament that were written to individual Christians and to churches. Now, with that in mind, let's look a little more 
background and, and introduction as time allows. We'll look at uh, Paul. Many of us are familiar with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul's authorship, being the writer of this letter to the Romans, is almost universally accepted and has been for as long as there have been people to consider it. But you can see Romans 1 and verse 1 is plain. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So you have that. And then you have other statements, such as in chapter 11 and verse 13, chapter 11, verse 13, and also chapter 15, verses 15 through 20, chapter 15, verses 15 through 20, that makes it clear that it's uh, uh, the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the church in Rome. Well, concerning the writer, this comes from simply a study of the New Testament and what it reveals about him is that we learn that he was a Hebrew by race, he even says he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and that background among the Jews, he says, was flawless. It shows you his dedication, his zeal, and his determination and steadfastness to do what he understood the law of Moses required of him. So he was of the stock of Israel, that is, a descendant of, of Jacob. We remember God changed his name to Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin, and he says, I was circumcised the eighth day, which the law required. And that's, you can read about in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5, Philippians 3, 5. One of the things that is, again, interesting is that he was a Roman citizen by birth. We learned that. We've already studied it in Luke's writing when we went through the book of Acts in Acts chapter 22, verses 25 through 29. Uh, we have spent time on what it meant to be a Roman citizen. At this time in the Roman Empire, uh, there were few in comparison to the masses that made up the empire who were citizens of Rome, and they had special privileges. Sometimes... Uh, it's interesting to read about what's come down to us about the everyday work of the Caesars. Now, most of the time, all we ever read about is how, how immoral and how moral and wicked they were. But that empire did not function without good administrators and people that knew how to run it. So when it comes to being wicked and immoral and pagan as they were, that didn't mean they didn't understand as to the way things were in governments of that day, how to run an empire. And a Roman citizen, as Paul did, had a right to appeal his case, whatever he was charged with, to Caesar himself. And that's exactly what Paul did to get out of the kangaroo court and the dishonesty of the Jews who only sought one thing, and that was to kill him just like they did kill Jesus. And when you read some that's come down to us about the day-to-day -day activities of the emperors, it's interesting to read about how they wore themselves out, not only in the general operations of running of an empire, but in listening constantly to all of these citizens who were appealing their cases to Caesar, and they would actually listen to every one of them. Now, you think about that as to what kind of time that would take. And there's some humorous things that uh, come out of that sometimes. It's been recorded, but we won't take time to go into that now. But um, one of them, I will say this, one of them, Caesar was out. I forget which one it was. I, I, I want to say it was Claudius. But anyway, one of them during the first century was out walking with his entourage and a citizen approached him and wanted to speak to him. And he said he didn't have time and uh, to talk to him right then. <laughs> and the citizen walked away speaking rather roundly saying, well, then you haven't got any business being Caesar. <laughs> so 
you don't think of people getting away with that kind of thing in view of what you read in history as to how tyrannical uh, the Caesars were, but they did. And uh, very interesting to read those things and just to realize the privileges, great privileges of Roman citizenship. So Paul was able to do that. And he knew that when he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen, everything the Roman Empire had to offer would be thrown behind him to see that he got that opportunity. Because if they didn't, the rest of them would have to answer to Caesar. Now, I've always found that to be interesting that God in his great providence had that kind of apostle that was chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles and that he was as dedicated and faithful as he was to God. And yet, he also exercised his citizenship in the Roman Empire to use it when it came to making his defense before Caesar of what the Jews had accused him of. And I think we get a preview of it when we see him uh, speaking before Felix, uh, Festus, and Agrippa before he ever went to Rome. And like all other Jews, um, he was taught a manual trade in his youth, and he was a tent maker, Acts 18 and verse 3. Now, that doesn't sound like much, maybe, but even nowadays with modern whatevers, if somebody wanted me to build a tent, it'd be rather rudimentary <laughs> if I built it, even with the best of fabrics. But the tents they made were sort of like the Rolls Royce of tents. These tent makers would make it out of goat's hair, and it was usually a special goat's hair coming from a certain goat that was black, and it would be so uh, woven together and sewn where it would turn water and do whatever else you'd want a tent to do. And that was basically what a tent maker was. So you can see it would be something, a trade, to where one would uh, uh, really have to know his business. The, the old Jewish rabbis, I don't know what they teach now, but back in those days, they taught if you don't teach your son to trade, you teach him to steal. Well, that's a pretty good idea, and it's not because they said it, but because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit that Paul made the statement that a person who won't work, neither should he eat, which God expects us then, and he assigned it to us from the beginning, back in Adam and Eve's day, uh, to, to work, and we find that husbands who will not provide for their own, God says is worse than an infidel, which means an unbeliever. So Paul was able many times, if you read through the New Testament, to support himself rather than call on these new converts to support him, which he says I had a right to do because he makes it clear that those who preach the gospel have a right to live off the gospel. But he did, that was an elective matter. And so to try to prove to the Corinthians, for example, that he wasn't just trying to get money from them, then he uh, did not choose to receive their support. In fact, he says in the Philippians, or to the, uh, of the Philippians, that they were the ones that sent to him time and time again to support him while he worked among the Corinthians. So that shows you the wisdom and how that sometimes when you have an actual God-given right to do something, it may not be the most expedient or advantageous thing to do when you're interested in the other person's salvation. So that's a good point to keep in mind. He was a man that we would say today, as far as formal learning, was of higher education. And what we know that he received came basically according to the law from Gamaliel, Acts 22.3, who was one of the great teachers of the law, who was a Pharisee. And so he said, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. That's obvious he had some other kind of teaching, or he couldn't have learned how to make those tents. 
And I don't know what all they taught them studying under a rabbi like Gamaliel, but I know in his writings, he would refer as inspiration guided him to uh, certain writings of the Gentiles. And he'll say, as certain of your own points have said, which shows that he understood the thinking and the mentality of the pagans and their philosophies and how their literature, what it said. And thus he's no ignoramus. And that goes along too in God's providential care that someone like Saul of Tarsus, devout in the law and understanding the Jews as well about could, but now converted to Christ and being a, what's called a Hellenistic Jew, one raised outside of Jerusalem and Judea, Galilee, he understood very well the Gentile mind also and the education of the Gentiles. This ought to teach us that as we go about laboring to do God's will, faithful to his cause, that God will provide for us those things needed to get us through whatever it is that we're into, good or bad, if we will but continue to learn the truth, live by it, and be wise in our application of it. And that may very well mean that you understand something about your neighbor, how he thinks from where he is coming, and uh, how you would approach him. I've used as an example, especially with all the Muslims around, and they don't eat pork. If you were to establish a good relationship with a next door neighbor who was a Muslim, and you ask him to come over and eat with you, would you offer him pork to eat? Well, of course, it's not anything to you as to whether you eat pork or not, but it is to him, and you wouldn't needlessly offend him because you would want to be able to work with him. And that's taught in the scriptures regarding things that within themselves make no difference to us at all. Paul uses that very line of reasoning when he's talking about Christians of that day and time eating things offered to idols. He said, you've been educated. You know there's only one God and one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and these idols are nothing. But your friends and neighbors, which would be most, are people who think these idols are deities. And therefore, if they offer you uh, food that was offered to an idol, but they don't say anything about it, they just offer the food as you would to anybody, then go ahead and partake of it. But if they offer that food to you, telling you it was offered to an idol, then you don't partake of it because you're considering his conscience, because he thinks it's offered in devotion to an idol. And he's told you that. And rather than set a bad example, you don't eat it. So you'll notice how much is said about eating things offered to idols. And the general rule was that you don't. But sometimes food would be around that had been offered as sacrifice, and what they did was cook it and then removed from the temples, sometimes even served in the temples, but taken down to, as he calls it, the shambles, and sold to the general public. But what is all that saying about being a mature Christian? It means when you take into consideration people, you take into consideration their views, and in those things with them that may be wrong, but it doesn't matter one way or the other to you, you've been educated out of it by the truth then you don't needlessly offend those people. Uh, so that's just uh, taking the truth of that day and time applied to their situation and applying it to our situation how we operate today. We don't have to be concerned about food offered to idols as he was and as those Christians of the first century was. But we can apply the same truth to situations today and uh, we're expected to do so. Now, the writer of Hebrews, who may have been Paul, we don't know who wrote it, but he made it clear that a lot of the problem with those who received the Hebrews epistle was that they had not exercised their mind 
with truths like we've been talking about in their dealing with themselves and others. And because they hadn't exercised, they had need again of one teaching them the first principles of the oracles of God and start all over again. So when you deal with people, if they are ignorant of the Bible as the word of God, is how God leads, guides, and directs us in our lives, then you've got to begin where you find them and take them to that given position. So when you have Saul, then he was a highly educated man in the law of Moses, in things of the pagan world, and being an apostle of Christ, having been baptized in the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, he had the direct guidance of Christ through the Holy Spirit to be able to do the things that he did, such as confirm the truth that he spoke to be from heaven and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders that he could do, and that the other apostles did. Now, looking more closely at him, um, his Hebrew name is Saul, and that's the way we're first introduced to him, is Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus is a city of Cilicia. He will at times refer to Tarsus as no mean, M-E-A-N, city, King James Version, which means it was a sophisticated city of importance. He said, that's my hometown. So Saul was uh, from there, and the word, the Hebrew name, Saul, means ask of God. Ask of God. Now his Gentile name that we refer to him most of the time with is Paul. Paulus, and um, in the Greek, that meant little or small, little or small. Some have thought that that might suggest something about his size. Don't know it, except in those days they tended to give names as they had something to do with the person, even more so back in the Old Testament than this time. Anyway, he is Paul primarily because he worked among the Gentiles. Jews would have called him Saul, but he was Paul, the apostle of Christ, to the Gentiles. You'll remember that when we're first introduced to him, he was a fanatical persecutor of Christians. Acts 7.55, held the clothes of those that stoned the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And you can see what he was doing several places in the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 4 chapter 26, 10 through 11. And he himself writes about him, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. And he makes comments about his uh, extreme persecution of the church. In other words, whatever Paul did, if he believed it was a thing to do, he did it with all of his might. And once he converted from Judaism to Christianity, then he was as much dedicated and involved as apostle of Christ in the church as he was in Judaism when he thought Christ was a false Messiah. Of course, his conversion was prompted, I think that's the right word to use, prompted by the supernatural appearance of the Lord to him when he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus and Syria on a mission to persecute the church, to arrest people and bring them back to Jerusalem bound because they were Christians. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Um, I think it ought to be said here that the Lord didn't appear to him to convert him. The Lord appeared to him so he could be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ because he was an apostle. No one, in order to be converted to Christ by the gospel, must literally with the naked eye see the Lord. But there was a reason then. In other words, the gospel of Christ could have converted Saul of Tarsus without him ever seeing the Lord if he was convertible. The Lord appeared to him to make sure that he could give eyewitness testimony that he had seen the Lord. And he'll even say that in defense of his apostleship. He says, have I not seen the risen Lord? 
Of course, he was probably the greatest evangelist that ever walked this earth. His first years of service to the Lord in that capacity was primarily in Syria. When you read through the book of Acts, as I said, we were studying the book of Acts, or studying so much of the Bible, even the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you don't watch out, you'll, you'll think these things all happen one right after the other, and yet there may have been years passing, as there was in the time that he spent in Syria and in Arabia and Judea, Acts 9, 9 verses 19 through 29. And Paul's own account of such things in Galatians 1, 17 through 21. Acts 9, 19 through 29, and Galatians 1, 17 through 21. So several years were then spent at his hometown, Tarsus of Cilicia, according to Acts chapter 9 and verse 30. Acts 9, verse 30. It was... Uh, Later on, when Barnabas was brought to assist in the work, or brought him to assist in the work at uh, the church in Antioch. Remember, the church in Antioch is the first Gentile church. That's the, not the Antioch of Pisidia, but it's the church in Syria, Antioch of Syria. There's two Antiochs, Antioch of, Sy of Syria. Syria, you, if you keep up with uh, what's going on in the Middle East nowadays, you know Syria is north of Israel and north and east of it. Directly north of Israel today, modern day Israel is Lebanon. And then directly west of Lebanon to the north of Israel is Syria. So he was brought by Barnabas to that work. And it's that church, as I've said many times, that sends first Paul and Barnabas out on the first preaching tour and then after Paul and Barnabas have their disagreement over whether or not to take John Mark, John Mark went with Barnabas to Cyprus, and then Paul chose Silas and went on the second and third preaching tour. We uh, also see from Acts 27, beginning in verse 1, through chapter 28, verse 31, right at the end of the book, Acts 27, 1 through chapter 28, 31, that he was in prison in Rome. And we have pretty good idea that he was in prison twice. He was let loose, and then he was in prison again, and it's thought that's when he wrote his letters to Timothy. And he points out in his second imprisonment that the time of my departure is at hand. And thus he knew he had been sentenced to death. By the way, because you're a Roman citizen, then they're not going to crucify you unless you've been leading uh, sedition. But what they did to Roman citizens and putting them to death, you just chop their head off. And uh, that was considered to be, if you think about those days and how you put people to death, uh, the quickest way you could put a person to death. So he would have died in that way, being condemned formally in a Roman court and thus executed. He would have been taken out, which is what they normally did, to the outskirts of Rome, to the city limits. And in the city limits, they would have a column that marked the beginning of the city limits. It wasn't a tall column. And uh, they would lay the prisoner to be executed head on that He'd stretch his neck over it, and that's where they would cut his head off, execute him. So tradition, what's come down to us through secular means, says that he was executed in about 67. And that would be what he's referring to, if such is the case, in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, to which I referred a little bit ago. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. And we don't know... Uh, what caused him to have to go to a second trial and be condemned, having been let go from the first imprisonment. But I, I'm going to guess, and you take it as my guess, that it had something to do with Nero burning uh, Rome and blaming it on the Christians, even though if he was executed in 67, that was sometime after that, 
it certainly in Rome itself had given a, I guess, put a bad taste in the mouth of the Roman government and in the pagans toward Christians. But that's only a, a guess on my part. The point that's factual is that he was killed. Uh, I don't know that you can establish, in fact, I know you can't from the scriptures, that Peter was ever in Rome. We know Paul was. So when people talk about Peter being in Rome, being the first pope and all that stuff, they have no proof of that from the scriptures, none whatsoever. And you got all sorts of proof that Paul was there. And by the way, uh, while he was in his own hired house, he was free to receive anybody who wanted to come see him. He had a Roman guard that was uh, chained to him. And he makes it clear uh, in writing, I think, to the Philippians, that he had converted people in Caesar's own household. And the American Standard says the Praetorian Guard, which was the special guard of the Caesars. They would be in the position of the Secret Service. Um, originally, and in fact, it would be at this time, most of the Praetorian Guard, if not all of them at this time, were selected from the Germans who were, of course, Rome had gone into Germany sometime before, quite a while before that. Never did fully conquer Germany, but they nevertheless had, as they did many countries and native peoples, had absorbed them. If you study Roman history, you'll find in their armies that they will call those people who are not true Romans allies, and they'll be a part of the army doing this and so. But then there were the true Romans from Rome. Uh, and so what happens is that the Germans were selected because they were taller than most people at that time. The average height of people at that time would, would be doing well to be 5'5". Five, five. And one of the requirements for one to be a part of the Praetorian Guard was to be six feet. Well, I can remember in my lifetime when you talk about a tall man being six foot, we would say it. But back in those days, uh, when you had people due to diet and so forth, not getting the growth and development due to health that they did, then the average height of people was that. It didn't mean there weren't people who were taller. It also meant a lot of people shorter. And uh, so when Caesar came out, if he was five, Five or five three, and he was surrounded by these big blonde six foot German guards. You'd whack your head off if you, if he nodded at it. Then uh, that kind of put people on their P's and Q's. But the only problem with that was is that starting with Caligula, the Praetorian guard being so close to Caesar all the time, began to make Caesars because it was the Praetorian guard that assassinated Caligula and placed Claudius on the throne. And as you go on down through the next 700 years of the Roman Empire, then they were very cautious about the Praetorian Guard, and it even got more so with the generals over the different legions. Uh, one of the things that maybe ought to be brought up here is that you'll remember if, if it's true he was... Uh, executed in 67. That's about the time of the rebellion of the Jews down in Jerusalem. They ended up with their complete destruction and uh, with it, Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in uh, AD 70. And that even could have had something to do with it. The year that uh, Caesar, or rather Nero Caesar, uh, was killed or we don't really know exactly what happened. We think we do. But there were three Caesars arose in one year following his death. And when you study Roman history, they'll call it the year of the three Caesars. And uh, each one of them uh, went up and down because of another one. And the legions were declaring the Caesars. Well, it was Vespasian and Titus who were leading the battle and the war against the Jews. And they had started down from the north 
in Judea, coming from Galilee, headed toward Jerusalem. And um, these goings on in the empire were taking place. And you'd have to study the life of Vespasian to see his connection with the other legions where he had served. And these three Caesars or these three generals went up and down within less than a year in being Caesar. And then the legions themselves in different parts of the empire called on Vespasian to serve as emperor. Thus, he goes back to Rome to become emperor, leaves Titus, his son, to finish the conquest of the Jews. And so it was Titus who led the legions at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, he would later, of course, become Caesar. I might mention this too, the ruins of the Colosseum that you see over there this day were built from the booty that was taken from the Jews when they were destroyed. There's a plaque that they found not many years ago that had remained hidden for a good while because somebody else had uh, put some other, some other Caesar and put some other sign over it and archeologists discovered it and were able to realize that originally it declared that uh, the Colosseum itself was built by the money, as if you want to call it that, that came from the Judean conquest. And the arch of Titus is still there. And you can see the depiction of them carrying the items out of the temple when they destroyed it. One reason we know what the golden candlesticks look like is because the Romans chiseled it into that column celebrating uh, Titus's victory called a triumph, a triumph uh, over them. And that arch is still there to this day. Um, so much for that verifying things that you read of in the inspired word of God. Well, uh, we'll stop here. It's about 8.24 or so. We can discuss further some of the things about Paul as we head toward the actual text of the book of Romans. And I hope these things have been helpful to you. And if you have any comments or questions, we'd be glad to once Ken unmute you. <laughs> uh, takes the, we take the gag order off and uh, you feel free to ask anything you might want to ask.